celebrate the north, let's celebrate the south, the east and west, the four cardinal directions. So this house, right now, we're on the north side. South side, opposite. Mm -hmm. Got the west. We got the east. Now, actually, it's about 30 degrees tilted that way, but yeah, for, all, for all purposes, right. that's where we stand. There are analog plant communities associated with the microclimatic conditions that a house like this, especially a two-story house, can provide. So as we rotate around the house, there's a different plant palette in place responding to the orientation of the structure. Here on the north side, the sun is going that way, we're getting much more shadow as the day goes on. And the analog plant community that you would find out there, a shady condition, is the understory plant community of a woodland garden. So here in the woodland garden, we have the types of plants that you would find in an under canopy setting. Under those oaks, up in the hills, in the ravines, down back in the canyons. And guess what? We are sort of surrounded by structure here, there, photocarpets here, and in limited space. So we also had to select plants that are going to be able to be more or less trained to fit the space, but not, not crowded. So plants like Prunus elicifolia, uh, <laughs> this is a holly leaf cherry. Keystone species, by the way. This keystone species, top three are oak, willow, and Prunus. These are the species that attract the most species of caterpillars. Most species of moths uh, and butterflies, uh, young, feeding the birds, feeding the rest of the food web. We've got lemonade berry, we've got coil. So in the wild, these can grow quite large. You'll see them out there and they're quite wide, but in the residential setting, you're going to be training them up. You're going to be pruning. You're going to be absolutely, you can already see, just naturally, they have a very upright growth pattern. But as they get older, this is going to magnify, and we're going to want to prune and train it up. And this space, maybe five, ten years from now, is going to feel cradled. It's going to be surrounded by upright evergreen shrubs. That building, and what you see here, is going to be, the view is going to be baffled. So we're going to be, feel more tucked in to this woodland setting. Uh, it's very difficult sometimes to get color into a woodland garden. You're kind of relying on different textures. You're relying on different foliage to bring diversity to it. There are a few flower, there are several flowering uh, perennials in the woodland garden. Fucara, one example. You might see some pollinators buzzing in and out of those. Uh, but largely, this is the berry producing plant community. This is the, these are the snowberries. The snowberries, the huckleberries. The foyon, the currants, the coffee berries. These are the berry producing plants in the woodland garden that are going to really be inviting the birds to forage. And not only that, you get the caterpillars in here and Betsy's going to have nests coming out her hat in there pretty, pretty soon. <laughs> they need to stay away from the huckleberries because those are for us. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> One cool microclimatic feature 
that we put in here. I don't know if you would call it a microclimatic feature, but certainly an element that has to do with the architecture is you notice that this is a little depression in the ground plane. Mm. And you can also think of your house, the roof, as a watershed, like a mountain. It's draining water into the gutters, especially after a rainy season like we've had. And guess what? We've connected a pipe, kind of see the pipe going underground here, into this bioswell, and you can't see it. It's kind of disguised here under the mulch. But there's a little drain inlet outlet here and when the water comes down it lets water out to this bioswale and plants like the vine maple and the mahonia the uh, organ grape snowberry really appreciate that extra moisture now you say oh, what happens if it overflows well you make sure the grading is right so that it can overflow that way and out towards the street. But here in Alameda, we have some sandy soils and the water drains really quickly. So you can see in the small space where we have this, have this path, we want to be cautious of any erosion, any water that might be going across because it will erode out this decomposed granite. You'll end up with a mess out there. Uh, but here, don't see any evidence of it, and that's because we've taken that water and we've run it into features like this. And there's a few of them. Do you remember how the many? Garden. Are there four there's, or there five? I think there are two more. There's, there's one over right here. Right there. And there's also one at the far side. On the far side. Mm -hmm. And boy, was everybody jealous of us. Because <laughs> <laughs> they had... Uh, they were swimming at Central and Six or whatever. Mm -hmm. Not smart. In the street. And here we were. Yeah, it was just fine. Drained. Yeah, we had no problem at all during the heavy rains. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I have a little cooler that's someplace in the side yard that now is like a uh, unexpected rain cistern. Because <laughs> it built, it's got all the rainwater from the last couple months. But uh, whereas before... You would be standing in big puddles with what we had before. It was just pretty much crabgrass uh, with previous owners' attempts to try and make a garden out of it. There was uh, hosta attempts. didn't work. There was a lot of agapanthus, and there's still agapanthus that keeps trying to come up. So thinking about microclimatic features, the yeah. ground plane, yeah. earth, you know, like Earth, sun has to do with the orientation of the space. Water, the watershed, uh, and wind. How shelter, you know, the building can actually provide shelter for some of those more delicate plants. Uh, so those westerly winds coming over here, you put plants against here. Some of these tall, up, upright growing, lengthy plants that you might be worried about when you get in a wind tunnel, they aren't going to get a wind tunnel here because we have this shelter of the house protecting them from wind. Any questions about the woodland garden here? Jeff, do you think you have enough light for the twin? Yeah. Because it's an understory. There, so. right, there are some native species that are incredibly adaptable. And the lemonade berry is not from around here. It's actually a Southern California, oh, coastal maritime chaparral plant. It's grown right there, cliffside in San Diego, uh, Santa Barbara, sort of right there on the coast. But guess what? It's incredibly adaptable. It can grow right here in a shady condition. Deep, deep taproot. Uh, one of the deepest taproots of any native plant. They've seen this one go down as deep as 17 feet. Whoa. So, oh, wow. <laughs> really tough plant. And guess what? If you go to Blake Garden in Berkeley, yeah. it's growing as a formal hedge down the driveway. If you go to 
regional parks botanic garden, it's growing, it looks like a small oak tree. So incredibly adaptable plant. Toyon, same thing, can take the understory condition as well as the really hot chaparral mountainside south facing. That's why we use them a lot. <laughs> they can grow in these very difficult situations. <coughs> Any other questions about the north side of a building and the <coughs> woodland type palette? Are any of them fragrant? Oh yes, there are lots of fragrances in here. Uh, one of my favorites that is really difficult to find in the trade is actually this plant back here, this grass. You get a chance, and it's, you know, sometimes it's there, sometimes it's not. Uh, this is vanilla sweetgrass, and it has a cinnamon type scent to it. And I like to, after these are done seeding, I actually like to cut off the efflorescence and put them in, in a vase, and they'll give a really pleasant scent uh, to your home. But I've only, I've only ever seen these at East Bay Wilds, which is a native plant nursery here in Oakland, and at Calcora Nursery, which is up in Fulton. Uh, near Santa Rosa. Chris, what is this grass here? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is Junkus. Uh, it's called a gray rush. Mm -hmm. And it can take periods of inundation with moisture and periods of dry. They so have a, a lot of this planted at uh, the target at Alameda Landing on the base, the point. So it's really nice. They had all these things that say, these are swales, these are swales, don't get in here. Um, but it, it's really cool to see them because they're so different from the other grasses you planted. It's a really great plant. And a lot of the, so this is a riparian plant. It also grows in grasslands. Uh, these are also called bioaccumulators because they can actually take up heavy metal, metals in wetlands. And then you cut them back and you're actually taking the heavy metals out of the soils. Uh, so cattails are another one, bulrushes. Uh, so really neat plants in the way they're able to actually kill the ground too from pollutants. They're kind of the kidneys of the plant community. So, so <clears throat> when this is uh, fully grown and filled in, how, how tall will this be? Yeah, well, that this guy, the smallest guy, will be the biggest plant yeah. <laughs> at some point. So this garden, you guys, is ten months old. Oh, wow. We completed this last July. <laughs> so yeah, it's been really happy with the rains. This vine maple is going to grow, expand out and it'll get about 15 feet tall over time. Mm. This the, little tree here. Yeah. Yeah. This was just a stick <laughs> two weeks ago, <laughs> and I thought it was dead, <laughs> except it had a tiny <laughs> bud. Yeah. Not that? dead, Acer. That's a vine maple. Mm -hmm. a vine We're maple. in the very southern range mm -hmm. of its uh, of its range. Uh -huh. uh, it's more of a northern California, Oregon plant, oh, okay. which is why we have it in the bioswell here, because it really wants some extra moisture. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's a nice small scale tree for a shady location. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, tur it it's one of the few natives that actually provides uh, some fall color too. It'll turn like an orangey uh, red color as it's dropping its leaves. And, and the other plants around it will uh, adapt to, to it? Right, so there's this idea of successional planting, which means that as sort of the evergreen shrubs are taking long, to, this is one of the slowest, gro I'm sorry, Betsy, this is That's one fine. of the slowest growing plants there <laughs> is, uh, the Oregon grape here. And the plants around it, like the hookahs, are here to sort of fill in the space until those guys get big. And then you'll have, and, and the snowberry, and then you'll have an informal uh, planting, mass planting, that gets about this tall. 
Mm -hmm. So we'll have a little more privacy. Some buffer from the bin area in the driveway. Mm -hmm. yeah. And how tall will the snowberry get? Snowberries, they'll range from about three feet to even they can get as big as five feet if they're really happy. Uh -huh. yeah. These are all on an automatic timer. Right now, timer's off. And when I turn it on, it'll be once a week. They don't get a, they get water just for like, what, 10 minutes, I think? Mm -hmm. Or did you set it for five? I can't remember. So at this point, we're going into the second summer and you want to give it a deep watering yeah. about once a week. Uh, the equivalent of about an inch of rainfall which on a drip system means like an hour and a half once a week. Yeah. Yeah. And that's in the dry season. Mm -hmm. Right now, doesn't need the water. <laughs> Is there some way to translate that into hand watering? Right, right. So you can buy these nozzles on a yeah, hose that yeah, actually yeah. tells you how many oh, gallons yeah. you're putting out there. And you want to put between about three about three gallons, that's the equivalent of an inch. It's, so you're standing there for like a minute for each plant. Yeah. Yeah. Give them a good, good water. Shall we continue around the bend? This is your home? Yeah. <laughs> Because I, we had someone from Albany who was supposed to be great. She came out, wonderful. Then she ghosted. And I had someone else, and he ghosted. And so the third time was a charm. And what I really liked was they had a, a, a specialty. So, what change do you guys notice about this plant as opposed to where we just came from? So, that's the thing. We've now moved from the north side. Sun is going this way, you know, as we get closer to the solstice, that solar angle. Gets up towards 70, to 76 degrees. So as we get closer to the solstice, more sun on this side. Uh, between the west and the east side, the west side is actually getting a little bit. The, the more sun loving plants are going to want the west side because the days had sun rises in the east. It gets warm, it warms up during the day, then it sets to the west, get the sun in here, you can have a lot more sun-loving, colorful native perennials. So now we've switched from the woodland setting where we have a lot of dairy plants, we have a lot of greens, a lot of different plant textures, to plants that, oh, what are the, these are, these are not gray or foley. There's a lot more hairs on these plants. Smelling a lot more things. Wow, what's that? What's that scent? Well, these are all adaptations that these plants have to preserve moisture in hot areas in the chaparral, in the south-facing slopes, uh, on on the coast where they're getting blown by wind, and that's all leading to this evapotranspiration. It's all drawing moisture out of the plant. Well, these plants have developed ways to retain the moisture. So when you see the gray foliage, when you see the upright growth, these are all adaptations to say, oh, not so much sun, you know, we want to preserve the moisture here. And, uh, so that's what you're seeing. You're also seeing a lot more energy these things are taking in to produce all these beautiful flowers. This is actually uh, pretty early in the season for this. When we see the poppies. Everything else is about a month behind, especially here in Alameda, where we're closer to the coast. So when we're closer to the coast, there's more of the maritime influence. 
more fog, it's cooler, temperatures are more moderated. So it takes a while for that influence of the summer to really get these plants going. Whereas in Southern California, thinking about the super bloom, starts earliest down there in the deserts of Southern California and then slowly it progresses up north. Uh, and that's just because there's more energy down there there's more solar radiation happening, and you can think of it like that uh, for here. I had the privilege of using the restroom in here this morning and opening the door, and wow, you're just hit with all these volatile oils in plants like the sage. Uh, that's probably the most profuse smelling one that's out here. Yarrows also have some aromatic scent in their foliage. Oh, what, which stage is this? Salvia chinlandii, Winifred Gilman. Oh. Now, you also see, again, we're in a small area. So the plants here had to be smaller cultivars smaller species so that we didn't have a bunch of plants spilling on to these very small narrow plants, uh, narrow paths. So lots of upright perennials, lots of perennials that are going to stay very contained. And another different plant you see out here are the manzanitas. Some manzanita species can take some shade. Others like it really dry and open and exposed and rocky. Uh, these two particular varieties, I mean, look at this. You get a lot of color from manzanita. Uh, this is called Pajaro, Archostaphylos pajaroensis paradise. It is a specimen that was selected, I think, just south there of Monterey. And you can see what a beautiful entry it provides here for this staircase. And it can take the winter shady conditions. So as that solar angle goes down during the winter, this front area actually gets quite a bit of shade. But that's okay. The plants just kind of stay a little dormant until the sun comes out. And now they're starting to expand and will be blooming. Yeah, there are several. This is actually a good one. Some of your your coastal manzanitas that grow right on the coast with the maritime influence. Those are some of the best ones for growing in shade. A lot of your brown cover manzanitas, the uh, Arctostaphylos uva ursi, uh, barberry, bur barberry, uh, they they can take the shade. They'll grow under a, a woodland condition. And you can see we're kind of transitioning here, so the plants selected on this side can take a little bit more shade. Can any take full shade, or that's only? Uh, yeah, this Uva Ursi uh, Manzanita thing. Yeah. Any questions on the west side of the house here? What's going to happen with the climate change when it gets hotter in this? Oh, these right. plants will love that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, these plants might suffer more, but uh, no. With the, these plants are very adaptable. Again, any plants that have the grayer foliage, more oils in their tissues that are upright, they're slanting their foliage so that they're not taking in as much in sun's rays. Uh, those are going to be the plants that are most adaptable. Little hairs on the foliage, are they fuzzy? Those are going to be the plants that are most adaptable uh, to these hot, hotter sites. Uh, um, how did you pre prepare the, the actual ground? Didn't have to. Uh, so these, here in Alameda, the soil sandy well-draining. These plants love that. 
Where you get into trouble is in the clay soils. It's tougher for the roots to get out there. It's soaking in more moisture. There's not a lot of oxygen in the soil. So plants tend to go, they tend to stay kind of smaller than they might usually be. You see a lot of deciduous shrubs in clay soil. And that's because there's not a lot of minerals available in the clay soils for uptake. It's all sort of trapped in the moisture in the heavy soil until it starts to dry out. And then you get in the spring, everything starts putting out leaves and then they're happy again. So the moisture content and clay soil can really affect what plants you can grow. Here in Alameda, it's sandy, tons of porous uh, porosity in the soil. So you can grow lots of different types of plants here. Where you get into trouble in Alameda is with the riparian species, the water loving species that grow in like the marshes. You might want to add compost and organic matter to those plants. So like this. There's some compost in this though, a little bit. Right, right. So we did do a little preparation here. We added some compost into the potting hole where we planted these. And that's not to feed the plant. It's actually because in nursery stock, they've been grown in ideal conditions. And that soil is just perfect for it to develop its roots out. And so when we put it into new soil, we like to kind of mimic that so it gets a chance to get its roots out into the native soil. Any other questions, you guys, about the, the west side here? And, and we did have a whole mountain of uh, mulch and compost here and took up half the street that eventually got spread out over everything. We, did. <laughs> we, did. we in general, we need a lot more dead material in the landscape, like wood and logs, because that's inviting the mycorrhizal connections, the fungi, into the soil. And those have root those have associations with the native plant root to where they attach to the end of the plant root. And the plants can take up micronutrients from the soil that they couldn't otherwise. Here in Alameda, that's really important because the soil drains so well that the nutrients in the soil leach out. And so you don't have as much available and really well-draining soil. So we want to invite the fungi friends into the equation so that they can hold the moisture and the nutrients for longer in the soil. So did you have to do a sheet mulch or you could fill the whole It's just a, a, an act of love every time. You go back, pull that out, you know. You're, you're draining the root systems of some of these really noxious weeds like Oxalis, the clover. Uh, every time you pull that, that's less energy going into the roots. And over time, it'll just desiccate. But you gotta stay on top of it for sometimes for years, to be honest. Yeah. Just keep pulling it out, it'll go away. <laughs> just want to make sure that you're not watering at the times where they don't want it, which is really in, the, in summer. You want to let the root system dry out. Uh, you know, they've already developed a deep taproot when they're mature, but if you keep watering them, it changes the soil chemistry, and suddenly you have fungi and bacteria there that are not normally there. In 
that's where you get into trouble. So you create habitat for these fungi and bacteria. Can you, can you order some lunch? I did. Oh, you did? Oh, oh good. good. Yes. It's kind of long. Okay, thanks. Thanks for doing Okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's still the science behind soil chemistry and what fungi are growing in the soil, what bacteria. They're different everywhere. It's, it's poorly understood how those associations are happening for individual species. It's still a, a development plan. Yeah. Yeah. So keeping it, the, make sure that the soil, the water around those plants mimic what's out in nature in our Mediterranean climate, which means dry, long, hot, hot summers and cool, rainy winters. Shall we go to... What's the name of this? Oh. I did not go that I mean... Oh, I missed that part. What did you say about that? No, That's not what happens. Yeah, no, no. It's not. milkweed out there that attracts the aphids. That's going to attract the mm -hmm. lady beetle larvae. Those kinds of association. Okay. So here, what happens to all the native plants? <laughs> well, this is a very different microclimate that's happening here. We're on the south side. This is the hottest side of the house. Very narrow quarters. Got this big wall here. And the sun is just going to be glaring off of that, putting back radiant heat that's absorbed by the house wall, reflective heat from the glare. And also we have an impervious uh, surface here that's also going to be bouncing the radiant heat off. So it's really warm, really sun exposed here. You can't tell here, you can't tell on a day like this but one thing that John and Betsy really wanted to introduce into their landscape were edibles. Citrus, apple, pineapple, guava. And where can you do that on a home site like this? Well, you want to do it on the south side. If you want that tasty fruit to develop those sugars, you want it in the hot location where it's going to get tons of energy. And so these are, some of these are dwarf varieties. Others are larger, but you're going to prune them into shape to be upright. And then the canopy to kind of spread out over what's head. And guess what? This will become a lot more comfortable area for human comfort. Yeah which is part of the microclimate. You want to make sure you're not only making it comfortable for a habitat for the plants, but also comfort comfortable for us. So as these mature, they'll be pruned up, the canopies will spread out, and we'll be getting a lot more shade back here so that we can sit on our nice lounge chair and enjoy uh, the splendor of our, our, our fruits of the, our labor. <laughs> so ideally, you would want fruit trees spaced out about eight feet. Here we were dealing with an existing condition where we had these cutouts uh, in the pavement, so they're going to have to be shaped over time. Need some more pruning. Uh, and we're really excited about this area. There are, there is room for exotics in the native 
landscape. So you just got to pick and choose your, your areas. And a great, one great area is on the patio where you have lots of concrete. Natives really don't want to be in containers for that long. <laughs> They'll look good for one or two years, and then they're like, where can we put our roots? And then they start looking sprawling and looking leggy. So exotics are sometimes the right choice for containers in, in a patio area next to the house. Uh, succulents, same, same thing. Fruit trees, you know, where you're going to get the most heat, where you're going to get the, uh, the most energy from the sunlight. Uh, and if you water, you know, you also want to be careful. Citrus are actually one of the more drought tolerant fruit trees out there. Uh, and you don't want to water them too much during the summer, otherwise you'll get watery fruit. So, uh, you know, a deep watering every couple of weeks, once a month even, if you're in a really moderate climate, like here in the Alameda, as opposed to inland over the hill. Is that in the summer too? Yes, yeah, in the summer. Uh, and all of these areas, the woodland garden on the north side, I call it sort of the maritime chaparral area on the south, on the west side. The fruit garden here on the south side, there's even a little veggie garden there in the corner. Yeah, some carrots growing in it. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> uh, these are all on different irrigation zones. They each have their own valve. They're on different watering schedules according to their needs. And even though we could have put one system throughout here, there's not much square footage here. This could have all been on one irrigation system, but it wouldn't have promoted the needs of each plant and the health of each plant. So we have five zones here because all these plant communities need different amounts of water at different times of year. And then we have the east side. A any questions about the, the south side? Here? Is this a native, these vines? These, so pretty. these are called Thunbergia. Oh, yeah, I took a quack vine. Spanish eyes. It's an Annie's Annuals plant. Oh, so it's not a native. <laughs> it's not a native, oh, but we okay. chose it because it stays really close uh -huh. to the fence. Oh, when it so when, when it matures, it's not going to grow way out here. It'll uh -huh. stay close to the fence. And yeah, it's a it's a there's many different cultivars of this. And they do well in partial shade? Or they or want sun? the sun. They want the sun. Okay. Now, this wood fence got built later. <laughs> so <laughs> what, they're the doing, what they're doing is they're reaching for the top. And when they get up here, then they'll start uh -huh. going wild. But yeah, yeah they're, these ones on this yeah. side are doing a lot better right uh -huh. now because they're getting a little bit more southern exposure, uh -huh. even though they're on the east side. Uh -huh. so <laughs> and we have our little butterfly factory over here. I didn't even notice that. So in these very narrow quarters, we're really reliant now on vines. We want something close attached to the fence. So now we're talking about clock vine. Bougainvillea was already here. Once the heat, southern exposure, here we are on the south side. But as we get to the east side, clock vines, these are going to stay very close to the, to the fence. It's one of the few vines that really stays up near the fence, so it's a good choice in, in close quarters. Uh, and we just got a little planting strip here, so we utilized some of the irises that were already here that, you know, as a heritage because these are, were very important to Betsy to, to keep them. And, uh, I think these came from uh, her moms or uh, family members. Uh, that's what I got, you guys. That was a lot. Are there, <laughs> are there any questions about, you can see how it's changed. As we went around the house, there's a different plant community microclimates for each direction, for each exposure, for each watershed.
But in an area like this, we're giving it what it needs. So here comes the sun. It's getting the radiant heat off of the off of the uh, wall. Reflective heat from the reflective uh, solar rays from the glare, and also the full full on. So we're giving them what they need so they reach their their full potential. And pruning in a small space like this, keeping up on the pruning is really going to make. What, what makes it more spatial? It's, it's question. So, question. Thank you. So now, so it's, you said the fence went up after words. So there was probably a plan. I mean, the plan would have involved um, probably a lot more sun because you had an open. Right. Okay. So right. is the sun coming this way or is it coming back? How is it? Yeah, yeah. So it, here's the east. Okay. And so it's, it's coming around. Coming so previously, yeah. before that fence, those were all in full sun. They probably. were. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Th there was actually a, a ruinous wooden fence there that was <laughs> that was about to fall over for ah. many, many years. It finally did fall over. That's why they put the new one in. Ah. Okay. Okay, so there was... It, there, was, it, there, a, was there, was there was a fence there, there was, already. Yeah, right. but a rickety, a rickety many old, openings. So, so yeah, there was many already the sun there was blocking. Blocking. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. Thank yeah. you. But we're not too concerned about that because they're still young. Right. They still have a lot of vigor mm -hmm. as young plants, and they're getting all this radiant sunlight and heat off of this wall. So they've got plenty to get them going. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. See, can I, I mean, this is not native, but a bougainvillea? I have a feeling it's 30, there's, 40 years old. That was there's doing one right there. That was a, one <laughs> yeah. that was here already. And again, they want the exposure. Right, because I found that's yeah. been dying, but it was uh -huh. prolific. For like we we used to have years. two. I don't know if they die at a certain age. Or, or, you know, I've asked a lot of gardeners. Nobody knows. <laughs> Uh, okay. Yeah, we did have two. We had that one. There was another one down there, and it did die when we had those couple of years of really, really harsh sun and no water. I think of about five years ago, it was like it got really, and so that one didn't make it. This one's held on. Yeah. Will the poppies come back on their own, or do they have to be replanted every year? Yeah, po poppies are semi perennial. If you cut them back at the end of the season. They'll put up some new growth in, into the summer. Mm -hmm. They won't be as floriferous as they are right now. And, you know, they'll remain even into the next year. Uh, but they'll also put out a lot of seed, and you might get a whole front yard filled with them, given the right <laughs> area. I have a lot of people pull those carrots out. Say, oh, that's enough with the bobbies. There's <laughs> on one of us to write it that where the street dead ends into it. They've got their own super bloom in the front yard. You see it around. Yeah. For the plants, did you cut? I'm sorry, I came late. You might have said no, that. No, you're fine. Yeah. Did you cut into sort of cut those no. areas out? No, those that was already there. They were already yeah. there. Mm -hmm. But, you, did that. but yeah. you you could cut them out. You could right. definitely cut out of a space like this and create more plants instead. I mean, we're into benign neglect. 
So. <laughs> <laughs> it happens like that, yeah. Yeah, I think they got that a lot of that. Yeah. Yeah. So everyone else will have beautiful little pots set up. That's what I got. Uh, I'll get to it. They have some things, and I'll get to it, maybe. You see those tomatoes over there, too. Uh, perfect location for tomatoes. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. 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 There, there's only <laughs> one little... That would change. Inside a vegetable garden. This is yeah. in a giant little box. Oh, God. You can stick the suckers in here. Yeah, they did. That was... Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Please let me know if you guys have any questions. My, my table set up over here and I'm happy to ask. I'm going to follow you. Yeah. 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 Yeah.